Danielle, what are you doing? I, I need to make a copy. Oh, hey, Bill. <laughs> this new copy machine we have, it's got some really weird functions. Like, you can make a copy of your face. No, no, no. Like, if you do this, it lets you look into an alternate reality in the multiverse. Sure it does. An alternate reality in the multiverse. Yeah. No, just take a look. Take a look, Bill. to explore an evening celebrating 35 years of the Planetary Society. Starring Neil deGrasse Tyson, author of The Martian, Andy Weir. From Star Trek, Michelle Nichols, Robert Picardo, and Jerry Ryan. The Deputy Administrator of NASA, David Newman. From JPL, Amy Meinzer, and space comedian, Andy Peters. Musical guests, American Pastime, and featuring a never before seen Symphony of Science music video. Here this evening from the Planetary Society, Jim Bell, Jennifer Vaughn, Emily Lakdawalla, Bruce Betts, Casey Dreyer, and me, Matt Kaplan. Tonight's show is brought to you by Parallax Brand Copy Machines, Print, Collate, Peer into Alternate Universes, and Make Crystal Clear Copies with Parallax. Now, please welcome to the stage the 323 Dance Company. Give it up for the 323 Dance Company. Now, please welcome our host for this evening, Bill Nye the Planetary Guy. Everything's fine. 
Welcome, 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 everyone. Thank you so much for being here this evening. I am the CEO of the Planetary Society. I'm so glad you all could be here tonight. We are going to have a fantastic time. It's our 35th anniversary. We were founded by Carl Sagan, my old professor, Bruce Murray, head of the Jet Propulsion Lab, and Ruth Friedman, an engineer there. And so we have now been an organization for 35 years. So we are celebrating with all of you. And 2015 has been a very exciting year in space. I'm sure you all heard the big news recently. After years of searching, NASA scientists believe they have finally found evidence of present-day liquid water. In California! Comedy is that simple. Now, this is a big show tonight. We have some celebrities here this evening in the show and in the audience. In fact, I just saw a science fiction legend out in the seats. Ladies and gentlemen, give a round of applause for the hunkiest character from the movie Interstellar. He's here tonight. Can we get a camera on him? Tars. Tars is here. Yes. Yes. Uh, Tars, Tars is the robot from Interstellar, Matt. You're a fan. Oh, yeah. I, big, big fan. Uh, so, Matt, back when I started doing the Science Guy show, uh, you know, people expected me to go by my old nickname, which was Bill Nye Science Dude. And uh, they wanted me to keep the rhyme going. They thought it was a good idea. They wanted me to legally change my name to Bill Nude. But science dude, Bill Nude, that would, that would be like a whole other kind of show. Uh, it'd be scary. Uh, uh, so I stuck with Nye and Guy. It goes way back, way back. Uh, I think it started in second grade. And uh, I, had, I had Mrs. McGonagall, and she, I did. No, did you know her? I had Mrs. McGonagall. And uh, she read from a great big book. Uh, the reason the ancient dinosaurs went extinct was because they had small brains and all the mammals took their food and the dinosaurs died. <laughs> and even she knew that was just lame. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, you know, it doesn't take a lot of imagination. I'm a Tyrannosaurus. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm a Tyrannosaurus. <laughs> and there's a rabbit. The whole thing is over in a heartbeat, for crying out loud. But my friends, there's a lesson here. In my lifetime, these discoveries were made. Because of space exploration, we know now that the ancient creatures were wiped out by an impactor, a fast-moving object that just slammed in at random from space. In fact, random, random space! space. In 1980, when the Planetary Society was founded, there was only one known trans-Neptunian object, Pluto. Now, there are more than 1,650 that are known. Uh, thanks. I was, I, I was going to say that. Uh, thanks, Bruce. That's Dr. Bruce Betts, the Director of Science and, Techno and uh, Technology at the Planetary Society. Uh, yeah, well, where was it? Oh, yes, yes, yes. In 1989, the Planetary Society put out this lovely little public service announcement, and we wanted to share with you this amazing video tonight. Take a look back at the video technology from 1989. Come with us on a voyage of discovery. Just 20 years ago, we humans first set foot upon another world. Since then, our species has surveyed all those wandering points of light in the sky that fascinated our ancestors. We have seen the mighty canyons of Mars, Jupiter's great red spot, Saturn's magnificent rings, and a huge moon with volcanoes spewing sulfur into space. The Planetary Society works to make available to everyone this treasure trove of knowledge from those epic voyages and to support new exploration 
It sponsors Earth's most sophisticated search for possible radio signals from alien beings and funds trailblazing conferences and research. It works to unite Earth's peoples in the future exploration of the solar system and for joint U.S.-Soviet missions to Mars. The Planetary Society. Members receive the Planetary Report, filled with stunning spacecraft images and astronomical art, and news of special society events. Your passport to explore the endless frontier. The Planetary Society, already the largest publicly supported space interest group on this planet and growing every day. Call 1-800-255-2001. Come with us to the planets and the stars. On. It was the state-of-the-art video, man. That Dutch caravel ship flew through there like this. It was fantastic. I mean, that was 1989. It was a TV commercial. This is before the internet. And uh, I had been a member back then, but it really wasn't until 1997 that I actually joined the board of the Planetary Society. It was around that same time that I met Neil deGrasse Tyson. He joined our board about the same time, so please, everyone, please welcome my very good friend of the last 20 years, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Neil. Hey, man. <laughs> it's the man. It's the man. Bill. Neil, have a seat. I can, I can do that. Uh, so, Neil, uh, your society was founded back in 1980, and uh, I thought it would be fun uh, to show everyone a picture of what you looked like, what you were doing in 1980. Can we, can we have that still frame? There he is. That's, Neil, that's badass, man. That's badass. That was back when I was kicking ass, yeah. 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 Well, you, were, you were undefeated. Uh, in high school, I was undefeated, but then I got to college and uh, wrestled people who... College at uh, Harvard. Uh, yeah. yeah, but, but we, we wrestled teams where these, they had wrestlers who, like, grew up on farms and, like, carried cows <laughs> out to past, you know, these are like corn-fed wrestlers. And, and so I didn't then have a winning record until my senior year, uh, but. So are you scoring, are you scoring along with the senior year? That's so, pretty so, cool though. But, so Bill, I did some homework of my own. <laughs> now, while we're on the subject of photos from 1980, <laughs> let's see what, Sir Bill Nye looked like back then. <laughs> so, it was early in my career in television. <laughs> I was an ad for the loop antenna, a quarter wave dipole circle to get your ultra high frequency. Really? Yeah. And there it is. Uh, so, so that wrestling was back in the day. I don't, I, don't, I don't do that anymore. What, wrestling competitively? Yeah, I mean, people say, oh, you still want to wrestle? You still want to do it? It's like, no, because when I was wrestling, I wasn't writing books, and I, no one was listening to me talk about the universe. That's I'm a different sorry, chapter. <laughs> That's a different <laughs> chapter of my life. But I caught you wearing that, that head thing just like a few days ago. So I don't know if you, you've gotten over <laughs> uh, I don't wear that wig too often. <laughs> Uh, but Neil, we go back. We, we met, I guess it was, um, it was uh, Lou Friedman. Yeah, I met you through the Planetary Society. I mean, I, well, I, of all the great memories I have of the Planetary Society, I must candidly and with warmth say that my greatest memory of joining the Planetary Society board is meeting Bill Nye, and who has become my friend. <laughs> 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 No, I mean, we're, we're, we're kindred spirits in our life's missions, and so it's fun just comparing notes at the end of the day. Uh, I convinced him to move to New York 
on. I know it's your loss, but our gain, you know. But he spent time here. He was lived in Studio City, and he was in Seattle. He got a. He, the, you had him, so <laughs> now I got him. Okay, so and he taught me how to tie a bow tie for the first time. I think that photo is on the internet somewhere, and. It's, it's one of these things where his arms are around me. It looks like very intimate, but it's really, he's just tying the bow tie, right, is what that is. Yeah. Well, he's, he doesn't even have to look. So we did that in, uh, in a bar in New York. Yeah, it was, a, it was a bar. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, Neil, we've had some adventures. I cannot help but hearken to the time that we were in the White House, and, uh, <laughs> and you had it in your head that you, you wanted a selfie with the president. Yeah, I just thought the th you, me, and the president would make an awesome selfie. Just note well, people, when you're with the president of the United States, there are photographers with, with cameras even better than this. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so we had a whole strategy, because there's a receiving boy, line. did you ever, no, no, there's a receiving line, usually, so let's see, he's greeting, like, there's like four people there, so there's one, two, three. It said he would greet Bill, and I'd be the last one he greeted. And then I'd turn back and say, let's do a selfie. And knowing that the photographer, and you know, you're not supposed to really put your arm around the president, you know, <laughs> like this, that, that's, no, you're not supposed to do that. But, but he, he jumped between us. Yes. And then I went to take the picture with oh, my- Oh, but there's I, more to it. No, there's more to it. <laughs> what? Okay, you are focused. Okay, here's the light. Here's the light from the window. Okay, I'm gonna stand here. Yeah, it's, it's just optics, I okay. got that. Yeah. I want the background, the background is going to be really good. <laughs> it's really good. And then you just, you go ahead. Okay, no, no. So I, so I pull out my, my phone and I'm ready to take the picture and there's no room left on the disc. His memory's full, people. His memory's full. Like I don't have enough problems. So I, if you've ever seen that picture on the electric internet that the kids use, I took it. Let's get another one. Hey. And then let's get another one with the audience. With the audience, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. So you, you carry on. I got I to gotta send these. Oh, wait, oh you're going to, like, post that? Yeah. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be with you in it. Okay. So, well, that, that's so. cool. Oh, by the way, at the time, Bill was just a board member. And it became clear that he had much more to offer the society than just being a random member of the board. And so over those years, as we, as he sort of, everyone observed him and his ways, uh, we, <laughs> we realized uh, maybe this man should actually be in charge. And so some years later, uh, uh, he became the CEO of the Planetary Society. Yeah. I left the room. I came back. Uh, you weren't there when we voted you into that position. No, I yeah. was. I don't you missed happened. that meeting. Yeah. Well, yeah. But there was when you're with Neil. Also, there's some wine. There's uh, stuff goes on. Wine is good. Room. I like wine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> Neil, we go way back. Uh, are you Star Trek or Star Wars? Uh, holding aside. The fact that Nichelle Nichols is gracing the stage offside for the moment, okay? This is holding that aside. I, as a scientist and as a rationalist, uh, if you're gonna do the Kessel Run, you should do it in a unit of time, not a unit of distance. But just one thing. Ow! I'm looking. Ow! Wait, I gotta cool myself down <laughs> off of that. So, 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 uh, as we know, Han Solo said, I did the Kessel Run in 30 parsecs, or whatever the number was. It was like, no. That's 3.3, that's like nine, that's like 10 light no, what like I'm 30 light What I'm saying is, it's a unit of time that he should have been speaking, not a unit of distance. Very and troubling. you should know by now how I react to movies that don't get their stuff straight. Pull back, Neil. So, so, so I'm Star Trek. Of course I'm Star Trek. Uh, hey, at least, you, you, I got, you nothing, are, I got you. nothing against the Star Wars people. It's just that don't ask me to comment on the science of Star Wars, because there is none, all right? So, Star Trek, 
has a science officer. Star Trek has engineers. Star Trek has people whose job it is to figure stuff out, okay? That's good, Neil. That, Neil, that here's, here's is one thing. What, good. Here, here's, Neil, you have God. captured the essence. <laughs> Sorry, you have understood what Star Trek is about. Meet me in the transporter room with Wait. Matt, you're, you're wearing a red shirt. Yeah, Matt, that's, that's not good, Matt. Matt. Yeah, meet me in the transporter room with the science officer and a couple expendables. Yeah. No, let I, deal. I regret that I have but one life to give for my federation. <laughs> But, Neil, the reason we brought you here, the reason we encouraged you to come all the way to the left coast... Uh, That's was, with north up, but if north were down, it would be the right coast. Well, but yeah. we are... Most of, the land in the, most of the land on Earth is in the northern hemisphere. That's right, 85% of the land. And the astronomy was discovered in the Fertile Crescent, and that's in the northern hemisphere. Sundials go clockwise. It's not coincidence, we're rolling with it. and Because sundials in the southern hemisphere would go counterclockwise. Yes, they do. So evidence that clocks were invented in the northern hemisphere. Yes. Is that cool? Yeah, it is cool. <laughs> but with that said, we brought you here because we want to do something Well, just to be clear, special. when Bill says a sundial goes clockwise, he's talking about the shadow of the gnomon. Yes. As the sun moves across the sky, moves in the direction that clock hands move. And since sundials precede mechanical clocks, if you were to make a clock emblematic of a sundial, you would move the clock in the same direction as the sundial Well, it's not, it's not a coincidence. Correct. Okay. And as I was saying moments ago, <laughs> we brought you here for something very special, very special to us at the Planetary Society, I hope to you at the Planetary Society, and uh, for this special presentation and for this discussion of why many of us are here, Ladies and gentlemen, to present the Cosmos Award from the original Star Trek series is none other than Lieutenant Yohura herself, Michelle Nichols. Tyson, it, was, it is with great joy that I, on behalf of the Planetary Society, grant you this very special award tonight, the Cosmos Award. The Cosmos Award is honored to those who engage the public in the romance of space exploration. This is an integral part of the Planetary Society's mission. With the original series of Cosmos, Planetary Society co-founder Carl Sagan sparked the imagination of millions of viewers around the world. To honor the innovators who follow in this tradition of presenting science and scientists in an accurate yet entertaining and enthralling way, the Planetary Society created the Cosmos Award for the outstanding pu public presentation of science. The previous recipients are James Cameron for his amazing work with IMAX. Uh, at the IMAX films about space. Paula Amsell for her wonderful work as the executive producer on the educational show Nova. And Dr. Stephen Hawking for his continuous, 
continued scientific engagement with the public. And now, Neil, you've accomplished so much. Star Talk Radio. All of your excellent books, and of course, the magnificently updated Cosmos show. There is no one more suited for this than you. So on behalf of the Planetary Society, please accept our great thanks and this, the Cosmos Award. Where is the Cosmos Award? With all of our, my banter with, with Bill, I now find it hard to speak following Michelle Nichols, who has essentially sanctified the stage <laughs> with her grace and her intelligence and her legacy. Um, made it that much more special for me to receive this award. I, an award is only as has, only has the gravitas of who has won it before, really. And uh, for this to have been won by Stephen Hawking, James Cameron, even though he got the sky wrong over the sinking Titanic, <laughs> he would later fix it for his centennial release of this movie. Um, Uh, I, I'm, I'm just deeply honored. Uh, what is now my almost 20 year association with the Planetary Society, uh, a 20 year relationship with the public that continues to grow. And it grows, I don't get big headed about it. I just, uh, I'm just, I say to myself, I'm helping to reveal the geek underbelly that exists within us all. And so. And that geek underbelly, in almost all cases, leads to ambitions about what tomorrow might bring. And the only people who are thinking about tomorrow are the engineers, the scientists, the science fiction writers, the actors who perform in those dramas. It is a community of people who are bringing visions of tomorrow to us all. And not all are utopians, some are dystopic. But then I'm reminded of a quote by Ray Bradbury who said, when asked, why are your future so bleak? And he says, I'm showing you the future that I want to make sure you don't inhabit. You need to know the future you don't want just as much as the future that you want. And so I don't know that I would ever want to live in a world without people dreaming about what a future may bring. And we know that the future of our species must include some ambitions that reach for the stars. Without it, we are surely doomed here on Earth. Thank you all for your warmth. Neil Tyson, ladies and gentlemen. Still ahead tonight, author of The Martian, Andy Weir, the American pastime barbershop quartet, and Jerry Ryan and Robert Picardo from Star Trek Voyager. Thank you, Matt. Now, fans of science fiction know that recently it was Back to the Future Day. 
the date from the movie made in 1985 from Back to the Future 2 was just a few days ago, or earlier this week. Now, we don't have hoverboards yet, but we at the Planetary Society like to think forward. We're always thinking about... Oh! Oh, what a ride! What a ride! Did I make it? What year is it? 2015 again? Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Who, who, who are you? <laughs> Sweet! It's a tardy grains! It worked! It worked! I made it! Uh, from where? <laughs> Don't you understand? It's me! You! From the future! And I've traveled back through time to tell myself something very important! Uh, uh, when did you come from? How far in the future? Two years. Uh, wow, uh, 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 we really, really let ourselves go. Uh, uh, uh what is it you, what, what is it that you want to tell me? Us, uh, me, you. Let's just say a straight diet of jerky in you who is no way for a man to live. But enough besmirching beef jerky. I've come back through the portal of time with dire news. Uh, what is it? Don't eat the triangle sandwiches backstage. Uh, are they poisonous? Is this, is this what happens? No, but they have ketchup on them. Ketchup? And we're not crazy about ketchup. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and we're not allergic to it either, but uh, we hate ketchup. We hate, yes, we, we hate ketchup. Uh, why didn't we just scrape it off? Or why didn't we eat another part of the sandwich or some of the other cool stuff that was there in the green room? Uh, fair enough. Portal's closing. Gotta go. You called it. Don't you have any, any prediction? Uh, uh, a sports outcome? Uh, oh, fine. Next year, the UC Riverside rowing team comes in second at the regional finals. Gamble well. Spend your money good. Worlds to explore. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Oh! Whoa. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage NASA Deputy Administrator, Dava Newman. Dava, oh my thank dear, you. look at you. Thank you, thank you. Let me do this. Mm -hmm. Wow, sorry, it was a little troubling. Uh, <laughs> Don't eat just, the ketchup. Just, just two years. I wonder if you can avoid it. I mean, when you meet your somebody from the future, does it happen? Can you change? Can, what if you, it's just very complicated. Deva, welcome. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs> Great to be here. You are the deputy administrator of NASA. You really run the show, and the other people just sort of do what you tell them. Second in charge. Second in charge. With Administrator Bolton. It's a great uh, job. It's a way to go. Way to go. <laughs> she had to say Thank you. So we have... The staff and uh, members have a few questions for you. And I've got a feeling this is right up your alley. This is, these are not tricks. These are not hilarious comedy gags. This is a real question. So how far along on the journey to Mars is NASA? We're on our journey to Mars. 50 years in the Fif making. 50 years in the making, yeah. Yes, because and today we have five rovers and landers at Mars, everyone knows. Our journey to Mars with humans starts on International Space Station. We're there doing amazing things. Scott Kelly's one-year mission. Scott Kelly's the twin. Scott Kelly's the twin. First time we get to do genomics. First, we're doing genomics. We're, we're going to compare so his. Scott and Mark mm -hmm. is here on Earth. After he gets back. Well, we're already taking data right now. Don't need and to personalized get Personalized medicine. Does he know that he doesn't need to come back to really to do this? He's going to come back. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then we leave from the International Space Station. Where do we go? Beyond low Earth orbit, so we go to cis lunar. Earth, Earth cis moon lunar. orbit. Which is uh, around Earth the moon. vicinity of the moon. Absolutely. And Different how do them. we do that? With the SLS, our space launch system, and the Orion capsule. Ready uh -huh. to go? Ready to go, exploration, so mission one. Understand the Planetary Society members have supported the space launch system. Uh, if we use it for planetary missions and increase the launch cadence to lower the price, increase the frequency, and inspire people the world over. Okay, Bill. It's that just gets us a cis lunar. That just, that, that, I'm 2020s, only, I'm only then we do all of our technology investments. By 2020, then. just 2020. four and a half, five in years. In the next decade, in the next decade, we're in cis lunar. 
And then? Doing in space propulsion first, solar electric propulsion. Mm -hmm. It have long-term habitats, life support system, suits. Now, life support systems. You have a couple of patents on spacesuits, <laughs> but yeah. you as a NASA administrator can't just go on and on about Deva and her spacesuits. But uh, just, <clears throat> you know, you saw The Martian. I did. Yeah. Shout out to Andy. Shout out to Andy. We'll be <laughs> here later. But how good were those suits? Pretty good. They had two suits. Everyone keeps asking me, you know, why were there two suits? Kind of the big white gas. Because you're the deputy ones. administrator of NASA, you would know all about a science fiction movie. Yeah. Well, it's where we, we're science, where, where science fact gets closer to science fiction, and vice versa. So the suits on Mars were great. We need mobility. We need lighter weight. You know, you have to be very, very, very mobile. So, so you're that's imagining what we're suits that to. are newer and cooler. Much cooler. Yeah. For kind of more the, for the runway. Well, we're going to low fun. We're going to further runway, fashion, fashion yeah, design. Fashion. But seriously, the Martian suits have to be lightweight. Now, you know, we're bipeds. We're getting to Mars to explore, right? Search for life. There you go. You're going to lope, actually. Lope. Yeah. Because 40% gravity. That's actually great. You just, it's great. It's going to be great. It's fun. You can run a marathon on Mars. Even I, with my knee. Bill Nye. <laughs> you run a marathon on Mars. To. Now, there's a very good chance at my age. I won't be asked to be a Martian astronaut, but there's kids, there are kids in the audience tonight who very reasonably may be among the Martian astronauts. What are you all, do you have a plan? Yes. Are you engaging young people? Here? We have a plan for them. Uh, I like to call it STEAMED, actually. Steamed? I need everybody, science, technology, engineering. I bring in the arts, math, and design. I need the and entire design. maker community Steamed. as well. Yeah. We're steamed to get to Mars, so I need everyone. Everyone's invited. We need to tell the human story. We need the writers, the storytellers, and of course the technology investments that we make in the 2020s and prove those systems out. Then finally we get to Mars in the 2030s, and then we're Earth independent. We're Earth independent. We're all about Mars. We'll be interplanetary species. Now, uh, you are a woman. You're an engineer. Uh, are you working hard to engage young women, girls, in the uh, Engineering? No, it's not hard. We just have to be inclusive. I'm working hard. Yeah. You know, as, as I like to say, half of the humans are women and girls, so why not have half the scientists be I, I think this is what a rocket scientist looks like. As far as I know, this is what all aerospace engineers I've got to say, the heads are pretty styling, girlfriend. Heads are pretty sharp. Now, uh, uh, one last question. What do you see as the role of NASA and international partners? So this is going to be a NASA US-led journey to Mars, and we're looking to partner with anyone who wants to come along. So right now, the model for International Space Station is fantastic. You know, 15 partners from around the world. So that's a great model. For Mars, everyone's welcome. We can't wait. And it's also private industry, governments, and citizens. We get to, we get to Mars globally. Globally. It's a different model from the old days. David, do you like your job? I love it. I think I have the best job in the world. Thank you so much, <laughs> David you. Newman, Deputy Minister of Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks so much. Guys, isn't she something? Wow. It won't be long before uh, humans finally do step down on the surface of Mars, and what they say when they first land there, will be immortalized, much like the first words of Neil Armstrong when he walked on the moon back in 1969. And so the society has conducted a survey, as we do. Many of you uh, replied to the surveys, did it online and a little bit of paper mail. And we found out what people believe will be the very first words spoken on Mars. And uh, here to re read the results of the survey, the president of the board of directors, Jim Bell, and the brains of the outfit, the chief operating officer, my friend, Jennifer Vaughn. Jim and Jennifer, please. So you may remember, the first words we heard from the surface of the moon, one small step for man, man. <laughs> One giant leap for mankind. Jim, this just isn't going to work when we get to Mars. Well, indeed, that is true. And so these results that we've compiled may be a little immature. 
okay? But remember, the people who are going to be the first people on Mars are in kindergarten right now, okay? <laughs> and now, with the top 10 choices for first words on Mars. Okay, number 10. These rovers up here cost billions, and they left the doors unlocked? Number nine, dear diary, I'm freezing my damn souls off. <laughs> Number eight, there's a speck of dust on the lens. Oh, wait, that's the Earth. <laughs> Number seven, it took almost a year to get here, and now I have to wait for my luggage? <laughs> Number six, do we even need this part in here in case of a water landing? Number five, the in-flight Wi-Fi was terrible. It took me 24 minutes just to get my email. <laughs> Number four, hashtag sick of Tang. <laughs> Number three, seven minutes of terror, more like nine months of soul-crushing loneliness. <laughs> Number two, What's a fella have to do around here to get a glass of red brine? <laughs> and the number one phrase that, we will be, that will be heard when we land on Mars? No rain in three billion years? I'm used to it. I just flew in from California. <laughs> Wait, we forgot something. What's that? Random Space Fact! Random Space, 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 space Fact! The surface area of Mars is approximately equal to the land surface area of Earth. So to explore Mars, it's like exploring the entire land surface area of Earth. <laughs> Jim Bell and Jen Vaughn, everybody! Thank you! Thank you! I'm used and, to it, I arrow break. Okay, uh, hi, you guys. Uh, Matt, take it. And now, get ready for comedy that is out of this world or any other world. Please welcome Andy Peters, space comedian. Hello? Check, hi, You're hello. I'm not, I don't know, man, I don't know why you kept saying space comedian. They brought me out as a space comedian. I'm just a normal, I'm just a regular, I'm a comedian comedian. They kept saying space comedian, but I, I guess, uh, you know, this is, you know, planetary society. I'll, I'll give it a try. Uh, give it up for my op opening act, Neil deGrasse Tyson, real quick, my opener. <laughs> he did okay. Woo! He was good of him to come out. <laughs> Uh, okay, space joke. Space, space, space. Uh, it's got to be spacey, real spacey. Uh, okay, okay, Mars. Mars is in space. Uh, recently, uh, Curio Curiosity rover found water on Mars. Big deal there, and I think maybe we should go up there. Andy, I've got to stop you. You're a really great comedian, but that's just not accurate. I'm sorry. Who are you? Who is, who is it? Matt, what's happening? Who is this? I'm uh, Emily Lakdawalla, senior editor and planetary evangelist for the Planetary Society. <laughs> Can we go on, Matt, please? Go for it. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm not here. I'm not just, just, I'm not here. All right. You're just fact checking? Not, yeah, okay. Exactly. <laughs> well, this should be, this is going well so far. I'm feeling good about it. <laughs> okay. All right. Next, uh, space joke. Space, space, space. Uh, okay. Let's talk. Uh, a big thing I've been reading about lately is. Uh, the uh, uh, Cassini lander mission. Orbiter. This is in the news. Orbiter. Uh, it's was uh, launched back in 2007. 1997. 1997, and it was, uh, it went uh, right to Saturn. No, Venus first. Venus first, and then it was, um, and then it's scheduled to actually crash into Saturn later this month. No, September 2017. September 2017. And I'm just thinking, here's the joke part. Can I do the joke? Yeah, go ahead. Here's the joke. I'm just thinking, NASA makes all these million dollar, billion dollar crafts and they just uh, plan on just crashing them into planets. I think it's a little ridiculous that they just do that. 
that's just rad. That's awful. You know, this, NASA makes these amazing spacecraft to do all this kind of science before they crash into planets. Cassini has done wonderful things. Cassini has found lakes on Titan and geysers on Enceladus. And they figured out why Iapetus is black on one side and white on the other. And they're even going to fly Cassini right in between the rings and Saturn before they do eventually crash into Saturn. So, no, they do so much more with these things than just crash them into planets. Okay, great. Anyway, I'm sorry. Carry on, carry on. It's a joke. Keep telling your joke. I don't know where the hell you got a whistle. I don't know if Bill gave you a whistle. <laughs> okay. Factual space jokes. All right. Pluto. Pluto. Pluto's been in the news. Pluto's back, baby. It's back. The New Horizons mission did a flyover of Pluto this year. Is that good? Fact check. Mm -hmm. <sighs> did a flyover of Pluto this year. So it's official. We have explored everything in our solar system. Pack it up. We have not explored everything in the solar system. That statement drives me absolutely crazy. There is so much other stuff out there beyond Pluto. There's Eris and Haumea and Quawar and Ixion and Varuna and Sedna. And even inside the orbit of Pluto, we have, we've got the moons of Uranus that we really haven't explored yet. We've hardly seen the surface of Venus. And there's ice at the poles of Mercury and the moon that we need to taste. So it is so not the end of the solar system. <sighs> Okay. Great. Hilarious joke. All right. So, so do you want to keep going with the joke? No, I'm good. I'm all no, set. No, no, keep, keep Joke's going. over. Tell a joke. Come on. You, you okay. can do it. Tell us a factual joke. I don't think I want to. But, oh, come on. You can tell one more joke. Come on. One Just more a joke? good factual a joke. A fact joke? A factual joke. Factual joke. Fact. Jo uh, fa fact joke. <laughs> Space facts. Space fact. Okay. Okay. This is a... Hilarious joke. The uh, uh, Uranian system has an axial tilt of 97.77 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> now that's comedy. Okay. Well, that's it. That's my closer. Thank you so much. I'm space comedy fact comedian and I'm Andy Emily Lakdawalla. Thanks. Tell me another one. Okay. The uh, series is the 33rd largest body. Andy in Peters awesome. and Emily Lakdawalla. <laughs> and now. Here to tell us about asteroids and planetary defense, please welcome Amy Meinzer from JPL and Bruce Betts from the Planetary Society. Hey, Matt, I didn't know you were here. Hey, Bruce. How's it going? Hey, Amy. So, uh, so asteroids are, uh, are dangerous, especially ones that are not rubber. Uh, the plan to be uh, uncharacteristically serious for a moment. The Planetary Society puts a lot of emphasis on planetary defense. In other words, protection of the Earth from dangerous asteroids, the threat of asteroid impact. It's something we were reminded of quite seriously in 2013 uh, when windows were shattered and hundreds hurt by an asteroid airburst, a small asteroid over Chelyabinsk, Russia. The Planetary Society has been funding planetary defense activities for almost its entire 35-year history. Earlier this year, we were the primary sponsor of, uh, a primary sponsor of the Planetary Defense Conference in Italy, where I got to hang out with longtime friend of the Planetary Society, JPL asteroid scientist, Amy Meinzer. Hi, Amy. Hey, Bruce. <laughs> Amy, Amy is the principal investigator of the NEOWISE space mission. Amy, perhaps you could give us a brief summary of NEOWISE. Sure. Well, NEO stands for Near Earth Object. So the goal is to find asteroids and other objects like comets. NEOWISE uses infrared wavelengths to discover and characterize asteroids. I hear you have uh, observed and discovered a, uh, a few asteroids with NEOWISE, like 10 or 20, something like that. Well, actually, it's a little more than that. Um, NEOWISE has discovered tens of thousands of asteroids, and we've characterized hundreds of thousands. Not too bad. <laughs> no, it's better than not too bad. It's really impressive. Uh, congratulations are also in order because uh, Amy is also the principal investigator of NEOCAM, one of the five missions selected for further study by NASA under NASA's discovery program. Amy, congratulations. And uh, yeah. Thanks. Just like NEOWISE is a, a spectacular success, NEOCAM is a, would be a tremendous mission. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about NEOCAM? Sure. Well, NEOCAM would place a sensitive infrared telescope 
in an orbit just inside of the Earth's, and from that position, it can find and characterize far more potentially hazardous asteroids than we can find from the ground. And that, of course, would be a big plus, because the first key, not surprisingly, to prevent asteroid impact is to find the asteroids. <laughs> The next is to track them, so observe them many times because it doesn't do you any good to know it's there if you don't know whether it's going to hit Earth. Uh, and then to characterize them, for example, determine if it's a binary pair of asteroids instead of one asteroid, which would rather change any deflection mission where you go to deflect one and you find two. The Planetary Society's Shoemaker Neo Grant Program for the last 18 years has funded amateurs and professionals to do tracking and characterization. Amy, I know you're a uh, fan of our Shoemaker Neo Grants. Uh, is that right? Absolutely. So uh, it's important to get as many observers as possible to track asteroids after we discover them because we've got to refine their orbits and know where they go. Shoemaker NEO Grant winners have helped to follow up some of our NEOWISE discoveries. So we are really big fans and we're very grateful for their work. Asteroid impacts don't happen often, but they do happen. They will happen unless we prevent them. And they are the one natural disaster we can truly actually prevent if we work at it. Planetary Society will continue working to do just that working on all aspects of planetary defense, finding, tracking, characterizing, deflecting, and educating the world. Amy, thanks for all you do and for joining us for our 35th anniversary. Of course. And there's just one last little thing, Bruce. Random space fact. Random, Random space, space fact. fact. Well played. <laughs> Last month, a meteorite a little smaller than the size of a baseball hit in Uruguay. It went through a roof, hit a bed, and then broke a flat screen TV. And this time, asteroids have gone too far. <laughs> Don't mess with our flat screen TVs. Okay, I won't. <laughs> How about another round of applause for Bruce Betts and Amy Meinzer? They are saving the world. Attention JPL employees, here are the announcements of the day. Please do not park in the yellow zone in lot three. Also, today in the cafeteria, we will be serving Tuna fish salad. <laughs> also, tomorrow in the cafeteria, we will have leftover tuna fish salad. Thank you. And have a great day in space. <laughs> he played a holographic doctor. She played a recovering Borg drone. Please welcome to the stage two of your faves from Star Trek Voyager, Robert Picardo and Jerry Ryan. Thank you, Matt. Good evening, Jerry. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Bob. Hi, it's so nice to be here celebrating space and exploration with the Planetary Society. Jerry, we are here tonight as actors from the world of science fiction. However, there is something to be said for the fact that reality often emulates fiction. Absolutely. Many real-life technological advances started as the dreams of science fiction writers. For example, I played a Borg drone on Star Trek Voyager, and so some of my character was made from robotic parts. And today we have the ability to make working prosthetic legs that people can dance and run on. And robotic hands that can actually crack an egg. Mm -hmm. Now I, of course, played a holographic doctor on the show, quite brilliantly, as you'll remember. <laughs> now at that time, holograms were only things of science fiction. But today, we have fully functioning holograms mm -hmm. and, of course, working holodecks. Mm -hmm. 
We don't, we don't have, we don't have fully functioning holograms. I mean, if we did, um, people would be living in them. This is a little embarrassing. They'd be fighting dragons and flying around and, and racing. Computer freeze program. <laughs> Does Bill not know yet? No. He doesn't know. It's, it's my fault. It's my human mind. I, I forgot to tell you. He does not know that he's a hologram. And it, frankly, it's better off. <laughs> I think it's better off if he never finds out, actually. I, know. I, I understand, totally. Well, let's just let's drop the hologram topic then. Right, good thinking. Um, <clears throat> computer, resume Bill Nye program. <laughs> Flying cars, see? Uh, no, Bill, I'm sorry, I, uh, I, I didn't mean to say holodex, I misspoke. I meant to say, you know, things like FaceTime yeah. and Skype. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, cool, right, okay. And how about medical advancements, right? Qualcomm has a $10 million prize for the team that creates the world's first medical tricorder. That's right, the Qualcomm Medical Tricorder Challenge. Because everyone could use a good old non-invasive biomedical scanner at home. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, it's funny because I haven't been sick in like. Uh, computer 50... freeze program. <laughs> you see, uh, <clears throat> when they um, when they developed the program, they obviously put in subroutines for aging, Clearly. but they forgot <laughs> very successfully, I might add. But they. <laughs> Computer, computer refreeze Bill Nye program. <laughs> but they forgot to add in the, you know, the sickness subroutine. Uh, so yeah. he hasn't, he thinks he hasn't had a cold in 15 years. You know, it, it really is, I mean, really amazing technology. Mm -hmm. yeah. really. It's almost, it's almost perfection. Oh, the real Bill. It's really, it's kind of a shame. Back in the uh, days of the Science Guy show, he was doing this presentation with a giant vat of uh, liquid nitrogen. Mm -hmm. You know, he was, this thing where he would throw marshmallows in. Apparently, he slipped and fell in the vat. Uh. And by the time they pulled him out, they slipped, they dropped him, and he shattered into thousands of them. <laughs> On the bright side, he is credited with having invented mini marshmallows. Uh, but anyway, this is the way he is since then. He's been a, a hologram ever since. That's fascinating. Is he, is he much different than he was before? Oh, yeah. Well, he's, uh, I've noticed, you know, the holograms tend to be much kinder than solids. And here we go again. Okay, resume program. <clears throat> About 15... Hey, Jerry, weren't you just over there? Freeze program. Uh, Jerry, you got to be more careful. No, Get back sorry, over here. Sorry, please. sorry, sorry. Okay. I know. I just, I'm not just used to. I'm not used right. to dealing with holograms. All right. What do you mean you're not used to dealing with holograms? You spend seven years with me dealing with me on the show. Talking about real holograms. You're not a real hologram. What do you mean you're a real human. hologram? Oh, come on. Well, what do you mean a real hologram? Freeze program. <laughs> you know, kids, we're having a lot of fun tonight, but let's not forget that holograms are people too. So if you know someone who is no longer organic, but now lives out his or her life as a projection of light and energy, as these two do, treat him or her like you would any other person. Thank you. Computer, resume program. And I don't understand what you... Uh, what? Robert Picardo, Jerry Ryan, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. It's a great job. Thank you. That's really good. Coming up later, the American pastime barbershop quartet and light sale. Now, please welcome to the stage Planetary Society Director of Advocacy, Casey Dreyer. I'd like to see a show of hands right now. How many people want to see more exploration of the solar system and our universe? Who wants that? <laughs> Good. If there was any hands that didn't go up, you're in the wrong show tonight. <laughs> okay, so next, raise your hand if you have actually written your representative in Congress 
to tell them this? Who has done this? That's what I thought. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you, by the way, those people who raised their hands. I love you. So it's writing Congress and doing things like this is not the first thing that comes to mind. Looking at Congress these days is maybe not the most inspirational thing. It's maybe not working quite well. But if you look at the facts, Congress has helped us, and the Planetary Society has worked, and our members have worked to add $400 million to NASA's planetary exploration program in the last three years. That's money. Thank you. That's, that's money that not, would have not been there. This year, Planetary Society members sent over 100,000 messages asking for a mission to explore Europa, Jupiter's moon with more liquid water than the Earth. And this year, NASA agreed to start that mission. That is a huge win. Every Planetary Society member can take pride knowing that they helped this mission off the ground. And it's not just Europa, though. As Emily said, there's a big solar system out there. And there's Mars with humans. And the advocacy team at the Society is working every day to get humans to Mars in a way that we can sustain it, that we can make it happen in our lifetimes. And that is something that we need every member to help us with. And this is a future that was best expressed very recently by a person I'm going to introduce to you now. He wrote about a future where humans were peacefully exploring Mars. Things didn't go quite right one of the times. But my favorite part was that it was a future where NASA's budget looked pretty healthy, maybe double. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the author of The Martian, Andy Weir. Thank you. Thanks, Casey. Andy, 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 thank you so much for coming, and congratulations on the, sec of the success of the book and the movie, The Martian. And we all appreciate the attention to detail, I think especially us geeks in here, we think it was just fantastic. Might be a couple of geeks here. Might be a couple of geeks. I mean, I just love how your character had to um, science the stuff out of Mars. Yeah, it's not the line. Uh, but uh, but thanks, it's, Bill. It's, Happy it's, to it's hear close. That. It's a close. <laughs> I paraphrase. Uh, so. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, that reminds me. Uh, I was just backstage, and we're down to 14 uh, bottles of water. You can't stop. So what does that mean, 14 bottles of water? What's the big deal? Well, we have 18 performers tonight, uh, uh, eight dancers, four singers, and 12 stagehands. I'll spare you the math, but we're going to run out of water at 8.42 p.m. Oh, that's the problem. But you know, uh, Andy, uh, we're not on Mars. We can get more water here. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, I, I, I get a little into it. You're just yeah. into character, and you yeah, just, yeah, I just, just can't stop yourself. Yeah, you know how it is. So did you do all those calculations in the book? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I calculated everything, even the orbital trajectories and uh, all that stuff. It, and that was fun. I mean, writing is, is hard, but screwing around on, online and doing math is fun. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, I don't need to know, but did you have a job during all this? Yeah, I mean, I was a, I was a computer programmer for 25 years, uh, and yeah, I mean, uh, and you didn't you didn't stop. It was just continuous. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I mean, it took me three years to write the book, and uh, I did it nights and weekends. It, it it really helps a lot to have no social life. Um, <laughs> it it really it really helps you know keep you focused. Uh, I, you know, I no girlfriends know. I, I, or anything I would, like that. I wouldn't know about that. <laughs> oh yeah. No. <laughs> No, being really geeky and no social life, I, very strange. I've got a girlfriend now, though. You've That's got cool. a girlfriend. Well, I've yeah, got a girlfriend because now. you're loaded. <laughs> yeah. No, it's good, dude. You deserve I think, it. I think she makes about double what I make, by the way. No, but, uh, you had, it went really, it's gone really well for you, right? Oh, well, I mean, thanks. It's really thanks. been brilliant, and uh, the movie is inspirational. Thank you. And uh, well, thank you. And the thing about it. No, no, it, thank you. No, really. No. no. Uh, so. The thing about it, everybody, that's important, uh, li literally important to us, is it indicates again how public interest, your work, has uh, 
revitalized or energized public interest in space exploration. And it shows you again that the reason the Planetary Society exists and the reason we thank you so much for coming is because we believe that public interest in space exploration is high, but government support is not, as, is not commensurate with that. And, but in your book, uh, our guy, our hero, is just, he's got it all, man. He's, he's got, got it all. adhesives, and, <laughs> and uh, he made water from hydrazine, just the way you do. You know. Uh, <laughs> have you ever tried that? Have I ever tried making water out of hydrazine? I don't think it's even legal for me to have hydrazine. <laughs> Have you ever tried? So yeah, I got tried. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever tried growing potatoes with uh, night soil? Night soil, very nice. Uh, no, I haven't. In fact, I I am the death knell to any plant. Uh, I mean, I'm the I have a brown thumb. As soon as I try to grow anything, it just dies. But this book is an extension of you, though, isn't it, Mark? Yeah. Watton? Well, Mark is really kind of what I wish I were. You know, he's like all the good parts of me and none of the bad parts, and. I think you'll find that every main character in a book is someone the author wants to be or someone the author wants to screw. So, For the record, I want to be Watney. Yeah, that's what so I'm just, like, good. Because there are recordings. Just this. make that yeah, clear. Your girlfriend's probably here. I just yep, learned there, that, yeah. uh, But this has been great. <clears throat> I mean, it's really been a fantastic ride, I guess, for you. It and you been. have enriched our lives. I mean, everybody, what, didn't we have a great time with this book and this movie? Yeah. <laughs> I'm watching. That guy, now, that guy didn't clap. That way back, well, third row over, from the back. Really, he's, now he's going to rush home and get it. He's probably going to take out his phone and download it right now. But uh, <laughs> Yeah, the, the illegal the, downloads are the best. I like that. Thanks. Appreciate no, it. We, no, we want him to be rich. You go, you go to one of the real sites. But this has been a great accomplishment, man. It's your first book, your first novel. Oh, well, my first published one. First published The one. first one that didn't suck. It really doesn't suck. But Thank let you. me ask you this. What do you have planned now after The Martian? Well, I've actually just finished my next novel. Really? Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, I have a copy over here in the lectern. Really? Yeah. Uh, well, you, it's like uh, ready for publishing? That's what it looks like right yeah. there? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, we've got the cover now, already. Andy, I, mean, I don't, don't want to hassle you, but I mean, we, everybody's here. Yeah. Could you read a little snippet, an excerpt from Yeah. It? It's a, kind of a follow-up to The Martian. It's called The Venusian. Uh, so I'd be happy to read it. Um, lights, please. <clears throat> <clears throat> the Venusian by Andy Weir. <laughs> Our ship landed gently on the hot Venusian rocks. As the doors opened, I could see the sulfur yellow sky flat across the horizon. I stepped slowly out the door and onto the searing surface. And then I was incinerated in an instant, the end. <laughs> That's it? That's the whole book? Well, yeah, I mean, it's really more of a novella. Uh, but you know, you, you know how it is with me. I want scientific accuracy. That's really important to me. So, uh, yeah. yeah, that's accurate. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the book is, is, is brief, uh, succinct. How long will the movie be, The Venusian? Uh, well, we stretched it out a bit, added some plot points. It's uh, going to be about three and a half hours. <laughs> cool. Andy Weir, everyone. What a good Thank sport. Thank you. You're a good sport, sir. Thank you. Wow. It's a real deal. It's a real deal. Thank you, Andy. I am very excited about our next guests. Uh, I'm a big fan. I am a big fan of both Star Trek and Star Wars movies. Matt, are you a fan? Uh, you know, Trek rules, but... Oh, I broke Spenny the Enterprise. Captain. I can't glue But who doesn't more. love the Force? <laughs> uh, so uh, what we wanted to do tonight, we're making some calls, you know, I'm big time minor league celebrity, so we wanted to bring out Chewbacca and R2-D2, but we're not, we're not going to be able to do that. <laughs> Sorry. Turned out to be, I think, uh, what they call cost prohibitive, a couple hundred K. So instead, we tracked down uh, some others. Uh, uh, generic ripoff. So please welcome to the stage from the lesser known movie Star Chores, Space Bigfoot, and Trash Can D2. Uh, it's uh, pretty, pretty compelling. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Big Space Bigfoot or 
SBF, uh, what, what are you doing? Doing the Star Chores! Star Chores! Space Bigfoot and Trash Can D2, uh... <clears throat> Matt, uh, seriously, seriously, <laughs> Did you see the Star Chores movies? Well, yeah, but, you know, those prequel episodes, they really ruined it for me. <laughs> Isn't it always the way? I'm sure every kids everywhere will be dressing up as Trash Can D2 for Halloween this year. Matt, what's next? I'm so glad you asked, Bill. As he returns to the stage, please give another round of applause to the president of the Planetary Society, Jim Bell. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Bill. Hello again. I'm Jim Bell, president of the board of directors of the Planetary Society, and I'm also Bill Nye's boss. <laughs> the power. <laughs> the power. Sorry. Sorry. Get it together. Okay. So this year, our light sail Kickstarter campaign had over 23,000 backers, and... And it raised over $1.2 million. Absolutely spectacular. Yes. This campaign was so successful. How successful was it, Jim? They don't know that. They just don't do it. They just need to pick it up like that. It was so successful, uh, and thanks to all of you who pitched in, that we are planning another campaign very, very soon. Okay, but, but we wanted to do something special uh, tonight and let you, the audience, vote on some of the rewards for this campaign. So I'm going to read some options here, get my, my pen out, take some notes, uh, and you can all vote by your applause for which reward you want us to use. Okay, the rules are pretty clear. Okay, great. First, at the $10 level, number one, some Planetary Society stickers. Okay. okay, got that. Number two, uh, some light sail mouse pads. Okay, a little bit of, okay. All right, and number three, uh, Bill Nye comes to your house for a week and walks your dog. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> uh, Jim. Excellent. Jim, circling. Jim, 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 wait a minute. That's a awesome. week for $10 I'm sorry, is Bill, crazy. Bill, Bill. The people have voted, all right? <laughs> we are democratizing space. If you, you wanted the light, the light sail mouse pad, I'll write you down for a mouse pad vote. Okay. All right. Now, at the $35 level, okay, number one would be a piece of solar sail material. It's made of mylar, Bill. Mylar. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Lots of work up there. Okay, number two, a light sail tote bag. Tote bag, some good votes for tote bag at that one, okay. And number three, Bill Nye comes to your house for a week and cleans your dishes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, I love it. Uh, we got that one. We got that one. All right. Jim, I, that's really, dude, it's just not practical. Dude, the, the people have voted. What can we do? It's democratization of space. Yeah, but Jim, I know, I know, hey, but hey, I, I never remember agreed Remember, who's the boss? Billy, who's the boss? All right, all right, uh, at the $50 level, number one, some kind of t-shirt. Okay, okay. Number, number two, I don't know, a poster, maybe a poster or something like that. Yeah, okay, a couple of votes. Uh, number three, Bill Nye comes to your house and personally teaches you how to tie a bow tie. Yes! For, for $50? 50 bucks. Okay, I'm, actually, I'm he's good with it. Idea. All right, we got that, that one. Great, that. great. Double underline. Okay, and finally, at the $10,000 level. It's a bit of a jump there, Jim. $10,000 <laughs> level. That's right. Okay, number one. Front row seats with Bill Nye at the 2016 light sail launch. That's a good one. Okay, number two, your face will be printed on the light sails, actual sails, visible from Earth. 
Okay. That's pretty good. And finally, number three, Random Space Facts! All right, scale model solar system, stick with me here. If the sun were at the top of your head and Pluto were at the bottom of your feet, then Uranus would be exactly where you expected. <laughs> The lights here in the Civic Auditorium are beginning to dim so that we can share a very special video with you. We take you back to May of this year for one of the greatest days in the history of the Planetary Society. From Cape Canaveral, Florida, here is the launch of LightSail. <laughs> This is 39 years. 39 years of messing around with this thing. And now I think we're going to pull it off. Guys, this is it! 39 years! dream to sail in space with sunlight and uh, that, that was I'm getting choked up it was really exciting it's cool it was really a tremendously exciting and incredibly inspiring day Please welcome back to the stage someone you just saw in that video, someone who was at the center of making that mission happen, our Chief Operating Officer, Jennifer Vaughn. Jen, that was a great day. Everyone, this is Jennifer Vaughn. You still get choked up? <laughs> I, I mean, cry a lot in that video. You do? Well, it's amazing. How long were you working on it? Working on the crying? Oh, the crying, <laughs> yes. It's very good. You could thank just you, do it like you. that. Yes. But um, everybody, yeah. understand, I'm the CEO, and that's a title, and it's important and stuff, and I have some, there's some contractual things I'm supposed to do on behalf of the state of California. But uh, Jen runs the show. I mean, she's the brains of the operation, and she was sitting next to me there in that video. And Jen, what, I mean... Tell us about light sail. What does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? Wow. Well, first, just to get it off the ground, that moment, I will remember it for the rest of my life. One of the greatest days in my life to see it finally leave Earth because it was a long time coming. We worked on solar sailing with the Planetary Society for more than a decade, as you know. But this idea goes way, way back before the Planetary Society as well. We have Lou Freeman out in the audience today. And, he is, he's one of the pioneers, and uh, of I course... I will have his book from 1985, I believe, <laughs> about solar sailing. And uh, I, when I was in class, Carl Sagan talked about solar sailing. And now, uh, 39 years later, 
we pulled it off, but many of you were there in 2005, and we put one in the Barents Sea, which is part of the Arctic someplace. And uh, so that would, that would be a down. If there were that ups and hard. downs. That yeah. was hard, that was hard. But even in this mission too, we had our ups and downs. Yeah. So yes, we, it was successful, we were so excited. But we learned a lot along the way. It was a test mission. And I wanted to take a moment to make sure we get a good look at oh, yeah. that image one more time from space, from our light sail spacecraft. It warms my heart every time I see it. I mean, everybody, it's really in space. <laughs> it's really in space, and it's not government funded. You all pulled it off. Uh, you all enabled it. So it's getting, just, uh, in this picture, it's just getting a slight nudge from the sun, and the sun shines all the time. So if this technology will enable us to democratize space, take spacecraft like LightSail to a lot of destinations in the solar system, just with a little nudge from the sun. So, uh, Jen, yes. I would be honored if you would tell us what's next yes, for LightSail. What's next? So he kept saying it is. It actually is no longer in space. It, it came down as expected, but this was a test mission that we flew this year. In 2016, we're going to fly again, this time on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy. Woohoo! <laughs> And we're going to get up higher, and because we're up higher, we're going to be able to stay up longer. We're going to be able to steer our craft and get a slight lift to our orbit, just with the power of the sun. Just the power of the sun. So we are on the manifest, everybody. We've passed all the vibration and thermal vacuum chamber testing, and we're ready to go. And it's thanks to you. And I strongly believe this will let everybody know that solar sailing really is viable, that this is a system that, that many, many spacecraft could take advantage of. So how many people here donated to LightSail? Applause. By applause. We can't see you. Good. You made this mission happen. Thank you all. How many people are members? How many people are going to join after tonight? Yeah, <laughs> sure. So you made, it, you made it happen, so thank you so much. It's all because of the power of people. That's right. Yeah. So I don't have a joke or a bit right now, as I should probably, but we got something else lined up that you might like even better. Really? Yeah, Matt, what do we have coming up next? Please welcome to the stage the American pastime barbershop quartet. Whoa. 
Gentlemen, thank you. Uh, can you tell us what's next? Random. 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 Fact. Space. Fact. The force of solar pressure on the light sail spacecraft in space is about the same as a housefly sitting on your hand on Earth. In a moment, we'll bring back Robert Picardo. First, though, the Planetary Society and more to explore would like to thank more of our terrific sponsors. Hansen's Astronaut Ice Cream. If it's not Hansen's, you must be eating real ice cream. <laughs> and Rapnor brand phasers. Set it to stun with Rapnor. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, you may remember him from Star Trek Voyager as the Doctor, or from Stargate Atlantis as Woolsey, or maybe from earlier in this show as Robert Picardo. <laughs> Please welcome Robert Picardo. Bob, it's so good to have you back. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you're having a good time celebrating space and our 35th anniversary. I was just chatting with Andy Weir backstage. It's so cool to meet him. You know, he was telling me that if I ever got trapped in a uh, Martian habitat without food and I wanted to grow potatoes, that there was a way I could do it without commercially available fertilizer. So you, you called me out at a really good time. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, now that you're back, I want to make an announcement to everyone here tonight. Robert Picardo has officially joined our board of directors at the Planetary Society. He's our newest member. Give him a hand. They're giving you a hand. Um, thank you, Bill. My thanks to other members of the board. I'm obviously flattered and delighted. Uh, and I happen to know that there are a few board members uh, here tonight in the crowd, and I hope I'm not overstepping my bounds, Bill, but I do I have some ideas that I'd like to run by you. Um, shouldn't take too long. You see, uh, 35 years is great. It's a, it's a terrific uh, legacy so far. I'm very proud of the organization. I'm happy to be part of this celebration. However, I am a futurist, and it's not about looking to the past, Bill. It's about looking to the future. Now that I'm on the board, I'd just like to share with you my 500-year plan for the Planetary Society. Five, now, five, first, 500 years. 500, yeah. First, we will seek out frozen worlds in the Kuiper Belt with a brigade of solar sails. Oh, yes, yes. That's good. Second, we will get electric hand dryers in the bathrooms at the office. Yeah. Because the towels are not green, Bill, and frankly, they're a little rough on my hands. Uh, Bob, Bob, do you think we really need 500 years to solve that? I don't want to rush it, Bill. I don't, you know, one step at a time. Yeah. You of all people, I thought, would know that. <laughs> Third, we will become instrumental in advocating for emission to the Alpha Centauri star system. Oh, bravo, bravo. Fourth, Bill, have you ever opened a frozen food box and the box is frozen and it kind of breaks really easily and those leftover chicken nuggets that you don't eat get freezer burn? What is up with that? Uh, we can address that. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you don't even have a solution for that. Go ahead. Well, it, it's a 500-year plan, Bill. <laughs> there is time to work on the important details. I'm just sharing, you, sharing with you the goals. Next, this one is very close to my heart. We instigate the technological advancements that will lead to holographic medical workers both in space and on Earth. Well, that, that's a good one. They're all good, Bill. So just, <laughs> just please keep quiet. All right. All right, next. You know how they make chips that taste like everything other than chips now? They make like 
coffee flavored chips, mango chips. In, the, in USA Today two days ago, Bill, there was a woman who won a million dollar prize from Lay's Potato Chips for making biscuits and gravy chips. Now I say, as a member of the board of the Planetary Society, why not make chips that taste like something else? Lasagna chips, coffee creamer chips, or in honor of the Apollo program, Tang chips. Uh, that's great. I'll, I, I guess we'll get right on that. All right, Bill, I, I asked you not to interrupt me. You can just affirm by nodding. But finally, perhaps the best idea, in 500 years you appoint me, Robert Picardo, as the CEO of the Planetary Society. Uh, wait, wait, Bob, hold on. You're gunning for my job. In 500 years, I have bad news for you, man. I don't think we're going to be around in 500 years. I didn't mention the one about developing holographic actors. I meant to add that. That would be important. Robert Picardo, everybody, you are a good sport, man. You're a good sport. I'm really looking forward to those electric hand dryers. And now a message from the rest of the board of directors for the Planetary Society. The Planetary Society is a nexus for planetary exploration. It joins together professional explorers, professional scientists, and the public, and unites them with a sense of purpose. I think any interest group needs an organization. Surely there are people out there who think about space, citizens, not even professionals, who think about space, who think about exploring the planets, who think about becoming a multi-planet species, and the Planetary Society serves precisely that role. We are filled with dreamers and doers and you know, people who love space science, space exploration, human exploration, robotic exploration. Planetary Society provides this ultimate bridge for anyone who is interested in, in space to be actively involved in planetary sciences. Well, I think what the Society stands for is why we are in space, that is to explore, to, to push limits, to see what's out there. Our species is one that has always explored, been curious, uh, wanted to venture out into the unknown. And while we've done a lot of that on Earth, the natural thing would be to want to go into space. The Planetary Society can make a substantial difference in the course of the exploration of space. I think the golden years of the Planetary Society and actually our civilization are ahead of us, not behind us. Hopefully the next generation can regenerate and restore the excitement and the enthusiasm and the passion for space exploration that existed when I was a student. Well, there are a few things that uh, I see for the society and hope for the society. First, that we grow. We become even more global than we are. What that will all mean is that we can have greater influence on space policy and ultimately encouraging those who are inclined to become planetary scientists. We are going to the stars. It's just a matter of time. You have a chance to really make a difference. You get to find your place in space. Who doesn't want to do that? The Planetary Society Board of Directors. As he arrives on our stage, please welcome the chairman of the board, Dan Jurassi. Thank you. Have you enjoyed the evening so far? I was sitting out there with you and uh, it was great to see the camaraderie, the, the relationships, the friendships, and the great friends that the Planetary Society has. But tonight is also about you. It's about those who support us, those who are thinking of supporting us, and those who have made so much possible 
for the last 35 years. It seems like yesterday that we were having our 25th. And I think it'll be very quickly before it's the 45th. But we're going in a new direction. We've set an entirely new trajectory for the society. And I think those of you that have known us for a long time can see that. You recognize that. There's a new energy, there's a new focus, and there's a new commitment. But for us to do what we all want to do and enjoy doing, we need the support of as many of you as possible. It doesn't take a lot, as you found out with the Kickstarter campaign, to put light sail up. And it doesn't take a lot for you to think of a young person in your life who could benefit from the gift of knowledge, from the gift of facts, from the gift of science. Buy them a membership. Adopt a class at a school, a science class. Adopt a school. Use your imagination. Give them a gift that will last them a lifetime. Knowledge, excitement, and more importantly, the thing that fired us all up when we were kids, those of us that grew up with Apollo. Give them the opportunity to dream about an exciting future because too much of what we see in front of us today is anything but exciting. And that's what dreaming's for. The Andy Weirs of the world put those dreams out there. Make somebody want to be part of a future where they can make a difference. Bill talks about changing the world. You literally can do it. This is within our control. Help us take the society to a level it's never ever been before. With a bigger international footprint and with more people following us, joining us than ever before. You have that in your hands, and I ask you to think about that tonight as you go home and reminisce about this great time we've had. But join us, because we're moving forward, and you need to come along for the ride with us. Thank you. Dan, thank you. Nicely done. Thank you. So it's been a, just a great evening, and I very much appreciate all of you taking the time to come, and we very much appreciate your support. Uh, the, it's been an extraordinary journey. The Planetary Society has been transformed. Uh, the staff is remarkable. Uh, the supporters are remarkable. And the work we're doing, I feel, is more important than ever. I like to say we do three things at the Planetary Society. We educate. We have these extraordinary journalists, Emily, Matt, Bruce, who publish uh, the source of information that a lot of people around the world in the space industry follow carefully because they're so good and accurate and so readable. Then I like to say we uh, create, and that's where we have these NEO grants to, to keep near-Earth objects from hitting the Earth to identify them in the sky and establishing a larger program to keep the Earth from getting hit with an asteroid. It sounds like science fiction, except it's a real, a real thing. And then, of course, we built the light sail after all these years, which is democratizing space, and we hope that universities and other uh, entities that want to have small spacecraft that will go to extraordinary destinations will be able to come along with us. And then we advocate. We go especially to the U.S. Congress, to a lesser extent to other governments around the world, and petition for the proper use of public funds to advance space science and exploration. And that's really what we do, is advance space science and exploration. We want citizens of the world to know the cosmos and our place within it. Now, as you may know, I was, thanks to Dr. Bell, I got involved in the Mars program, and there are these three sundials on Mars. And these carry with them the first message to the future that people have put on a spacecraft since back in the disco era. And they say, we've sent these spacecraft here in 2011, they ran here in 2012, we, studied these, we built these instruments to study the Martian environment, learn about Mars's past, prepare for our future. And then it says in very small letters, it says, to those who visit here, 
We wish a safe journey and the joy of discovery. And my friends, that is the essence of what we do. We want people all over the world to feel that joy of discovery, to be part of this larger idea that will change the world in the same way that Newton and Copernicus and Galileo changed the world, but it will not be an individual that will have done it. It will be all of us. It will be a society that felt this was a worthy use of our intellect and treasure so that working together, we can know the cosmos, we can know our place in space, and my friends, we can, dare I say it, change the world. Now at last, thank you. Now at last, I gotta say, we have something spectacular to show you here at the end of the show. Our friend, John Boswell, who goes by the nickname of Melody Sheep, makes these fabulous music videos about science and space and other things, and he calls them the symphony of science. Well, he's made one newly, just for us, to unveil here tonight for you for the first time. So ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy Beyond the Horizon. We are at a, at a time in history where we can change the world. What do we want to pass on to future generations? That we just stayed here on Earth, that we didn't look out to find out where we come from and are we alone? No, we want to pass on this joy, this excitement. When a nation dreams big, everything falls into place. Beyond the horizon, beyond the horizon, over the next hill, over the next hill. That's where we make discoveries. That's the next frontier. It is in us to look farther and deeper. It's deep within us. That is why we are all here. Over the next hill, beyond the horizon. Dream of tomorrow, tomorrow. Long for the open seas. All for this adventure. Dream big, 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 big. dream big. Dream of tomorrow, tomorrow. Long for the open seas, for the open seas. For the open seas. visions have the power to alter mind states, to change assumptions about what is possible. Beyond the horizon, beyond the horizon over the next hill, over the next hill that's, where we make discoveries. that's where we make discoveries, that's the next frontier. It is in us to look farther and deeper, it's deep within us, that is why we are all here, over the next hill, beyond the horizon. If we are to discover life on another world, it will change the way everyone feels about what it is to be a living thing in the cosmos. Is the virus alive? Is the crystal alive? Does life need this? Does life need liquid water? Is the virus alive? Does life have metabolism? Does life need? Life need. Life need. Life need. This is the virus alive? Is the crystal alive? They're ask, 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 asking these questions. Working together, I claim we can change the world. Change the world. There's a just tremendously exciting prospect called solar sailing, and it works exactly as uh, an ordinary sailboat does. It takes you to where you want to go. It's a whole new kind of idea. It travels on the wind from the sun. It takes you to where you want to go. It's a whole new kind of idea. It travels on the wind from the sun. These dreams prevail in the citizens' ambitions. It is time to set sail for the 21st century. Beyond the horizon, beyond the horizon over the next hill, over the next hill. That's, where that's where we make discoveries. That's the next frontier. It is in us to look farther and deeper. It's deep within us. That is why we are all here. Over the next hill, beyond the horizon. Beyond the horizon, that's the next frontier. It is in us to look farther and deeper. It's deep within us. That is why we are all here. Over the next.
The show! Happy 35th anniversary, everyone! Thank you so much for coming. Here's to another 35 years on incoming! Thank you all! Let's change the world! Good night! Thank you all, thank you. Drive safely. Try best that we can.